everyone, and welcome to Top 10 in 10 um, Psych Review for your AP Psych Test. Now, this time we're going to be talking about the biological basis of behavior unit. So, everybody's favorite, right? Biopsych. And this is a big chunk of the test, so make sure you pay close attention. All right. First, I would like you to pay attention to the difference between not just the nervous system and the um, endocrine system, but the breakdown of the nervous system. This comes up over and over and over again, right? We started with the bio unit, but then we have it in therapy, and we have it in fear and emotions, and we just, it's all over the place, right? Motivation and emotion. Okay, so the nervous system breaks down into two main parts. The central, right, which is in the center, your spinal cord, your brain, and the peripheral, right, which is the PNS. It's on the periphery. It goes outside from the spinal column. In, this, in the peripheral system, you have the somatic and the autonomic, right? And the somatic and the autonomic, somatic is body. So it's the body, it's the voluntary movements. And the autonomic nervous system is the involuntary, stomach, heart, lungs, all those kinds of things, right? And then the autonomic breaks down even more into the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And the sympathetic is your fight or flight, and your parasympathetic is your rest and digest, okay? It's also good to know the motor and sensory neurons. So same, right? Um, sensory, afferent, motor, efferent. So it goes from the sensory organs to the central nervous system, and then from the central nervous system, the motor neurons take it back out to the muscles and glands. Okay. In addition, right, we have the hormones, and it's very you you have your endocrine system, which use hormones, right? And um, important in this, I would really focus on the pituitary gland, right? Making sure that you know it's the master gland, right? And the pituitary is connected to the hypo, um, hypothalamus. It's controlled by the hypothalamus. And the adrenal glands tend to come up pretty often, you know, um, when we talk about the fight or flight response. And then ovaries and testes as well. Okay, your body is a neuron. So, well, actually, it's hundreds of neurons. Anyways, it doesn't matter. So, we have some parts of the neuron you got to know. Dendrites, right? They listen, right? So, your dendrites are these little guys, right? And they receive the message. They send it toward the cell body, which then sends the cell body. The axon takes it away from the cell body. The axon is covered by the myelin sheath, which is a protective covering, right? And that's what it looks like, right? Okay. And the axon sends it away from the cell body to the terminal button. The axon terminal, terminal button, axon tips, they're all the same. Inside the axon terminal, right, or the terminal button, are vesicles that hold the neurotransmitters. The neurotransmitters then, boop, they like kind of get spit out, right, and they go, boop, 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 right, and they jump across and they attach to new receptors. And then those receptors, they wait for enough of the message and then they send, right, and then you have your new action potential. Okay, now, when focusing on action potential, right, there's a lot that you could know, okay? So, in terms of what's the resting rate, right, it's negative 70 is our resting rate for action potential, okay? Then once the threshold is met, you have the depolarization, then you have the repolarization, the refractory period, and then back to resting potential. So, if you look at resting state, right, you see the sodium channels blocked, right, you have Ks in here, potassium channel, whatever, right? So, it's just hanging out. It's negative because even though sodium and all these things are positive in comparison to the outside of the uh, like the, the in, in comparison to the fluid outside of the axon it's negative okay then you have depolarization in this instance the sodium channels open and sodium floods into the neuron right and then that's where you have it going up here right and then three you continue right depolarization so more sodium comes in then now you're going repolarization four, it's the falling, it's the next phase, right? And now you have some of the potassium goes out, right? And then, so then now you're, you know, going back down. And then for a while, uh, you know, you have kind of hyperactive K going out and the um, NA sodium can no longer get in. And so for a very small window of time, you have that refractory period where nothing can be reset because it's not at its resting potential again, okay? So make sure you know, do the wave. Neurotransmitters. Okay, they come back over and over again. They're not going away. You need to know them. So learn them. Acetylcholate, right? Alzheimer's, AA, memory. Serotonin, sleep, sex drive, mood, depression. Not enough, right? Okay, 
Um, and then mania, you know, is overload of serotonin and a couple of other things. But it's important that you know depression and serotonin are related, okay? That's why you have to know an SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. We'll talk about that when we get to therapy, but here it is again. Dopamine, reward and pleasure. Dopamine, for me, I always think of the drugs, D and D. So drugs generally work a lot on dopamine. Not just dopamine, but that's the reward pathway. That's where addiction really takes hold. Schizophrenia has too much dopamine, so medicine stops it. Parkinson's has not enough med- dopamine. That's why schizophrenia, some people with schizophrenia who take meds have Parkinson's-like symptoms because it's stopping the dopamine. Endorphins, pain relief, okay? Uh, norepinephrine, heart rate and arousal. Not sexual arousal, but like <gasps> that kind of arousal, all right? And in anxiety, they generally have an increase, excuse me, an increased level of norepinephrine. GABA. Inhibitory neurotransmitter stops messages, glutamate, excitatory uh, neurotransmitter, um, and that's sometimes we talk about how an excess of glutamate can be related to migraines. Okay, agonist versus antagonist, right? Because this is like things, like it could be a drug, or it could be a food, or it could be a lot of things, okay? So, agonist, dopamine, cocaine is an agonist, more dopamine, right? Uh, serotonin, Agonists are SSRIs because they block the reuptake. Remember, we're talking about this. The blocking of the reuptake is not an antagonist. I know you hear the word block and you think stop, but it blocks the reuptake. The okay, so it stays in the synapse and resends. Carbohydrates are an agonist for serotonin. Endorphins, painkillers, opiates, those all increase the amount of endorphins. Um, alcohol actually increases GABA, which is why you end up having slower processing, slower reaction time, because you have more inhibitory messages. And then norepinephrine, something that increases it's an agonist, is cigarettes. It's just kind of, these are examples, not by no means an exhaustive list. For antagonists, Botox, right, and spider venom are both ACH antagonists because they prevent muscle movement. Dopamine, antipsychotics, right? They lower the amount of dopamine in the system by blocking the dopamine receptors. Glutamate. So alcohol increases inhibitory messages and decreases excitatory messages, okay? And then norepinephrine, beta blockers, uh, which sometimes people take if they have issues with um, heart disease or other things, that it can actually prevent the um, norepinephrine response. So it stops it or, you know, dampens it. Okay, so the brain, right? Pinky and the brain. So if we look at all of our different, we talk about the perspective of the psychology. So the brain, okay? And we need to know the different parts of the brain. So we'll start at the bottom and work our way up. Hind brain. You have the brain stem, the medulla, and the pons, reticular formation. For this purpose, the reticular formation and the pons, you can put them together, okay? And it's more important that you know the difference between the medulla and then those two. The medulla is heart rate breathing. Okay, and the reticular formation and the pons are with sleep and arousal. Not sexual arousal, alertness arousal. If I damaged your reticular formation, you could lapse into a coma. Cerebellum is your balance, also considered part of the older brain, right? And when we old, we mean from an evolutionary standpoint. The limbic system comes next, right on top of that. You have the hypothalamus, the hippocampus, and the amygdala. Hypothalamus, four Fs, feeding, fighting, fleeing, making love. Hippocampus. If you ever saw a hippo on campus, you would never forget it. And amygdala. That's anger and rage. Now you have the lobes. And this is the cerebral cortex. Okay? So the cortex is all the gray squiggly stuff. You have the frontal lobe, right, which controls thinking, planning, and movement. The motor cortex is in the frontal lobe. Then you go back one, right? Remember the frontal lobe thinking. And you go back on the parietal lobe, you scratch your head, okay? Part of it is touch sensations, but also like making sense of the world, spatial relationships, perception, how far or close you are to something. Then you go in the back, occipital lobe, eyes in the back of your head. Temporal lobes right by your temples, okay? Controls hearing, um, also deals with language, smell. Okay, a couple of little parts of the, the cortex that you need to know. So I just talked about the motor and the sensory. Those are specialization areas. Here's another two specialization areas, the brocas and the vernikis, okay? The brocas is boca, mouth in Spanish. So it's the ability to move your mouth and it's in the frontal lobe. And the vernikis is in the temporal lobe and that's the understanding of language. Like, what did you say? Right, that's the what, huh, huh? The understanding, not the saying it, but the knowing what's being said. And in this case, um, 
when you have like, they talk about agnosia and aphasia. So Broca's and Wernicke's deal with aphasia. It's not being able to understand language. But agnosia generally is more of a visual uh, problem or sometimes hearing where you can't like, you can see a face, but you can't make out, you can't like put the pieces together. Or you can see this, the, the shape, but you can't tell me what the shape is as a whole. You have a hard time recognizing shapes or images. Okay. So aphasia goes with language generally um, and speech. And agnosia goes more with vision and hearing. And those are two types of brain damage that can happen. Okay, split brain, right? So with the split brain, I know, right, Mr. Split Brainy. So you have the right and the left hemispheres, right? Hemis lateralization. That means the right has some jobs and the left has some jobs. Nobody is purely right or left brain, but that doesn't mean they don't have specific jobs. So left, language, logic, L, 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 right. Emotions, visualization. Facial recognition, okay? So it's important to remember, whatever you see with the left eye can be drawn or picked up with the left hand but goes to the right brain. Right eye, right hand, left brain, okay? Now it's also important to remember that if it's the right eye, you can either say it because it goes to the left brain or you could pick it up or draw it with the right hand, but you'd be more likely to say it. So the idea is if you have the choice, you would say it rather than pick up or draw it. But on this side, on the left side, you don't have that choice, so you'd have to either pick it up or draw it. Okay, and the last little bit, I want to talk about the nurture versus, uh, nature versus nurture argument here because we use twin studies for a lot. So if you, get a if, you get a, if you get a question on twin studies, it's very important that you look at what is the question asking you, okay? With identical twins, you're looking at do they have the same, they have the same genes, so if they're in the same environment or in different environments, right? If identical twins are more likely to have something, then it has to be based on the genetics, Okay, that means something, but, but if identical twins don't both have it all the time, environment has to play a role. Okay, so make sure that you're focusing on if it's what in the scenario is it that they have the identical twins are more likely to have it or are they asking because identical twins don't both have it, does the environment play a role? Fraternal twins are no more similar than regular siblings when it comes to genetic differences. So focus on that too, right? Okay, that's all for now, AP Psychos, and remember, psychology is flippin' awesome.